Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers of the IPPA for inviting me to give this talk. And I'd particularly like to thank Michael Steiger who reached out to me for this plenary. Michael, if it weren't for you, I'd be in the mountains right now, but you're a hard man to say no to. Um, I'm Richard Ryan. I'm a co-founder of Self-Determination Theory, and I'm hoping that some of you uh, know about the framework. It's a widely used approach to studying human motivation, healthy development, and wellness. And research in intrinsic motivation has touched on a lot of areas of interest to positive psychologists. We really began our work with the uh, phenomena of intrinsic motivation and the things that uh, undermine or facilitate that really important human resource. Uh, we've also done a lot of work on internalization and how people can take social values and make them their own. And a principal part of our work has been on the determinants of well being, and particularly the role of basic psychological needs in the promotion of people's wellness. We've done a lot of work on people's aspirations and goals and how they affect basic psychological need satisfaction, some of which I'll talk about today. And also what are the elements in really close relationships that work for people? Across these various studies, self-determination theory has been brought into work on mindfulness, on energy and vitality, on emotion regulation, on the neurological underpinnings of autonomous motivation, on cultural differences in motivation, even on political and social and economic influences on motivation. So a whole variety of topics. But I'll say that at the core of all the research that's done in SDT, the central question has always been this, what do people really need to flourish? SDT as an organismic and an a eudaimonic theory really argues that it's in our nature to flourish in the same way that in, it's in the nature of an acorn to become an oak tree. It's within us to develop our capacities and to become more self-regulated and uh, more full functioning over time. But the movement in the direction of greater integration and greater development is by no means automatic. It requires nutriments, both physical and psychological. And when we discuss those kind of nutriments within SDT, we use the term need to describe them because a need is something that's essential to a living entity's growth, its integrity, and its wellness. A need is something that when you're deprived of it, you show degradation or uh, wilting of various sorts. And when it's satisfied, there's evidence of thriving. And this is not just true of physical needs, it's true of psychological needs. We say there are some basic psychological needs that are essential for psychological growth, integrity, and wellness, that these are natural to all of us rather than acquired. They're in a sense part of our evolutionary makeup and that's why they're universal rather than culturally specific. And they don't necessarily need to be valued or consciously, you don't even need to be aware of them for them to have an impact on your, out, on your, on your thriving. Because we have such a strong definition of these basic nutriments or needs, uh, we've come down to only three that uh, we can all agree on, and that's the basic psychological needs for competence, autonomy, and relatedness. There may be more psychological needs, but these three have been able to uh, have an evidence base that suggests that they are truly fundamental. Just briefly, competence is, uh, is the basic need people have to feel effective and successful when they're undertaking activities. And really, the, there's some version of the basic need for competence in every major theory of human motivation. People want to experience efficacy, but they also want to see opportunities for growth and development uh, so that they can extend their abilities. And when they can do those things, they really feel that satisfaction of competence. The second basic psychological need is for relatedness. People need to feel connected with others and a sense of belonging and inclusion. And that really comes about because you feel cared for by others and also because you're significant to them, possibly through the ways that you contribute. Finally is the basic need for autonomy, which is very central to the work in self-determination theory. Autonomy is defined as behavior that is self-endorsed and that reflects one's authentic values and interests. When you're autonomous in what you're doing, you're willingly doing it and you're wholeheartedly engaged in that what you're doing. The opposite of autonomy is heteronomy or feeling controlled or pressured to act. The experience of autonomy in your workplace, in your relationships, in your general lifestyle deeply affects individual wellness. And because it's so important to self-determination theory, I just wanna clarify a couple of things that autonomy is not. First of all, autonomy is not the same thing as independence. Independence means you don't rely on other people for help or for guidance. But 
you could be autonomously independent when you want to do something on your own, but you could also be autonomously dependent when you willingly give yourself over to the guidance of another. Autonomy is also not about individualism or collectivism, and it's certainly not about self-interest versus caring. If you're autonomously collectivistic, that means you're wholeheartedly behind collectivistic values. And as this talk will reveal, some of the most autonomous things we do are caring for other people. And it's also true that autonomy does not mean that there's an absence of requirements or demand on a per, uh, demands on a person, but rather that when they undertake an activity, they endorse those demands or the legitimacy of those demands. So that, again, they're willingly following requirements that might be around them. And finally, it's not the same thing as freedom. Freedom means that there's an absence of constraints, but autonomy has much more to do with not just an absence of constraints, but also having a sense of purpose and direction and what you're doing that you stand behind. Central to the whole theory of uh, SDT then is that when we can find satisfaction for our basic psychological needs in an environment, when we feel support for autonomy, competence, and relatedness, that we flourish. We show more intrinsic motivation. We show more internalization of social values around us. We have higher quality behavior and better performance because we're wholeheartedly engaged in what we're doing and we care about our actions. And we experience more vitality and wellness. Just as one quick example of SDT research showing this, this is a recent meta-analysis or a summary of many studies that have been done in a particular area that was led by Gavin Schlemp and colleagues that just shows the SDT model in relation to flourishing. This was a meta-analysis that included over 83 samples and over 30,000 participants across nine countries looking at workplace environments and what conduces to wellness within them. And what the meta-analysis showed is that when you have leaders who are needs supportive and particularly autonomy supportive, employees have all three basic needs satisfied for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. This in turn leads them to feel more engaged and uh, willingly uh, focused on their work. And the outcomes of that is that they feel more well-being at work, they have less distress, they're more engaged, and they engage in more positive pro-social work behavior, like helping their, their fellow employees or doing positive organizational uh, behaviors. Now, SDT's focusing on flourishing is an example of its eudaimonic approach. Um, and we really draw here from Aristotle, who defined eudaimonia not as a particular state of mind or a kind of happiness, but rather as a way of living, a way of living that entails actualizing one's potentialities and, uh, and really pursuing one's excellences and virtues, these being our most human characteristics. SDT extends this Aristotelian argument by hypothesizing that the pursuit of those things that are intrinsically worthwhile deeply satisfies our basic psychological needs and therefore fosters wellness. That is, when you live a eudaimonic lifestyle and you engage in moral and virtuous activities, this will lead to outcomes such as subjective well-being, vitality, greater feelings of meaning, and it will do so via experiences of greater autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Now, interestingly, Aristotle feared that most people don't have a good handle on what the good and worthy is that they should be pursuing. In fact, he says, to judge from their lives, most people that is the most vulgar, seem to suppose that it's a life of pleasure and that's why they favor a life of consumption. They're looking for well-being in perhaps the wrong places. Aristotle argues that truly happy people are those who've cultivated their character and their minds and they've kept the acquisition of external goods within moderate limits. The unhappy are those people who've managed to acquire more external goods than they can possibly use, but they are lacking in the goods of the soul. Now, Aristotle's position then is that if we pursue excellence and virtue and self-actualization, this will lead us toward the good and in the, in the doing of that, we will become happy. But cultural messages tell us that there are different routes to happiness. In fact, cultures often tell us that we can buy happiness, that happiness uh, is arrived at through consumption and through hard work and success. Indeed, the more you achieve, the more you have money, the more you have possessions, and the more you have the right image, the more you should experience uh, the quote, American dream or the happiness that comes from those kinds of values. So finding a pathway to the good life can be confusing for people. You know, some people say, all you need is love. And then others are saying, well, love comes after the money. And it's not always clear how one should live. So a long time ago in SDT, we started to research this, uh, and this really began with work uh, 
that I was doing with Tim Kasser, asking people, what are you pursuing in your life? How important are various goals to you? We found quickly that people's life goals separate into two broad categories. One we called extrinsic life goals, the people who are after money, fame, and image. And another class of goals that we called intrinsic life goals, which are closer to what Aristotle would have thought as the eudaimonic pursuits of pursuing personal growth and learning, pursuing intimate and deep relationships with other people, and really giving to the communities around us. And in our even early research, we found quite quickly that the more people placed importance on intrinsic goals, the higher their well-being, and the more relative emphasis they place on extrinsic goals, the lower their well-being. And for instance, in this particular study, Tim Kasser and I found that in an urban sample that people pursuing intrinsic goals as their important goals had higher self-actualization, more vitality, fewer symptoms of depression, and fewer physical symptoms of stress like back aches, headaches, stomach aches, et cetera. And the opposite was true for people who emphasize extrinsic goals in their lives. There's been literally dozens and dozens of studies on this in the meantime across uh, many different kinds of settings. And one of the findings has been that these effects of intrinsic and extrinsic aspirations on uh, well-being outcomes like life satisfaction are mediated by basic psychological needs. In other words, when you pursue intrinsic satisfactions, you get more autonomy, competence, and relatedness, and that leads to greater life satisfaction, where if what your aspirations are are about money, fame, uh, success of that sort, even if you succeed at those, they probably won't directly fulfill basic psychological needs. In fact, they may even interfere with your autonomy and your relatedness, and this in turn will hurt your life satisfaction. This pattern of findings has been found all over the world. In fact, it's been tested in more than 30 uh, international samples at this point in time and in groups of all ages, teenagers, parents, adults, retired workers, and in workers of every occupation, not just uh, educators or athletes or, uh, or people in the healthcare professions, but even people in business schools show the same pattern of events. The more they're after just money rather than after doing social good, uh, the less happy they will be. In fact, recently, uh, Emma Bradshaw, who's a postdoc who works with me at Australian Catholic University, uh, is, has just finished a meta-analysis looking at the history of all of these intrinsic and extrinsic aspiration effects. And she finds uh, what the theory predicts, which is that intrinsic aspirations in general predict higher well-being, and that's not so for extrinsic aspirations. Now, just as a quick illustration of that, I want to cite a study that comes from Ken Sheldon and uh, uh, Sheldon and Krieger, actually Krieger being a lawyer who's worked with Ken uh, on various issues. And they were trying to study happiness in lawyers. And they did a large survey of uh, lawyers across the United States and, and found really three types of lawyers. One type of lawyers they called social advocacy lawyers. And these were people who joined the law profession in order to do, to do social good. They might work for environmental causes or work for people who uh, can't afford defense counsel, trying to do uh, social advocacy in their work. Another group of lawyers they called money lawyers. These are basically people who went into the lucrative parts of the legal profession uh, who would uh, maybe be the people who would defend corporations against environmental lawsuits or work for hedge fund companies. In other words, their focus is on making more money. And then there was a third group that was mixed in, in, uh, in there. Now, what they were interested in is who's happier, the money lawyers or the social advocacy lawyers? And typically, if you're looking at happiness, you would control for income since it's a, a somewhat positive influence on happiness. But what they found is that even not controlling for income, the money lawyers who made much more were much more unhappy than the social advocacy lawyers. And we can ascertain here that the social advocacy lawyers felt more autonomy every day on their jobs because they were pursuing things that they really valued and stood behind, where money lawyers, even if they were succeeding um, at making money, they were often having frustrated psychological needs. So happiness resides not always in even getting what you want. Sometimes uh, you have to be careful what you wish for. This study also brings out the fact that doing good seems to do well for people. And people seem to like to do good. They clearly do. 
you know, we see people in volunteer organizations. We see people easily giving directions to other people when they're asked for. All around the world, we see kindness. And it seems to describe human beings a lot more than uh, aggression, at least on an everyday basis. In fact, we think helping and pro-social behaviors are truly adaptive propensities. And, you know, when I was a uh, uh, a young scholar in psychology and evolutionary psychology was just growing. It was often argued that you know, people evolved in a competitive and hostile environment in which selfish individuals more likely survived. And this means that human nature adaptively became more aggressive, greedy, and dominance oriented. You know, the tune has really changed in evolutionary psychology over time. In fact, data from disciplines from comparative biology to anthropology show uh, in contrast that we really evolved as group animals, that we're typically highly cooperative, we're really sensitive to injustice and prone to helpfulness, especially under non-threatening conditions. And SDT's perspective is that this adaptive propensity is particularly functional in part because it's associated with proximal inherent satisfactions. Uh, putting that more simply, SDT suggests that when you're benevolent and you give to others, it feels intrinsically motivated and it fulfills directly people's basic psychological needs. This idea that pro-social behavior and helping others is intrinsically motivated, uh, I, I, th I think is a very important idea for uh, positive psychology. And it's been shown in multiple ways. I'm going to describe a study here that's not from SDT, but I think fits fully with the SDT framework. And it was done by Warnikin and Tomasello at the Max Planck Institute. They, like we, believe that pro-social behavior is often intrinsically motivated. And to show that, they were looking at helping behavior in 20 months old. And, and what they found is that toddlers spontaneously help other people when they're in need. Uh, in their experimental settings, they would have adults do things like drop papers on the floor or have trouble reaching an open door that they wanted to close. And toddlers, uh, even at 20 months of age, spontaneously go over and help these adults. In fact, you know, close to 90% of the time when an adult is in need, a child will help them out just spontaneously and without reward. Wernicke and Tomasello reasoned that if this is truly an intrinsically motivated behavior, then rewarding children for helping should undermine it in accord with findings, uh, for instance, that we've had repeatedly in self-determination theory. And that's what they did. They brought children into a laboratory settings and they had them help other people. And they had three conditions. In one condition, when the child helped a, a needy adult who, for instance, might have dropped papers, uh, the adult simply accepted the help, but said nothing. This was a neutral condition. In another condition, the uh, adult gave what we would call non-controlling praise, which is they said, thank you for doing that. And in a third condition, they rewarded the child for having uh, helped them. They said, oh, you get this for having done that. And they gave them a preferred uh, toy uh, that they could use uh, for having helped. On a subsequent occasion, they brought these same children back and the results, and then they, they had uh, opportunities uh, in this now free choice period for children to again, spontaneously help adults. And what they found is that children who had been in the neutral condition continued to help adults at about a 90% rate. And that was also true of the children who were in the praise condition. It was a non-controlling praise and it had no negative influence on, uh, on uh, intrinsic motivation for helping. But those children who had been rewarded for helping showed a much lower rate of helping, more now down to 54%, I believe it was in their study, showing an undermining effect of a classic sort. This again gives evidence for the idea that pro-social behavior is intrinsically motivated. In our own labs, we started to look at this through the lens of need satisfaction and uh, with a hypothesis that willingly or volitionally helping others satisfies all three basic psychological needs, and that accounts for the increases of wellness. That is, the more autonomous a pro-social act, the more it satisfies basic needs, and the more it enhances wellness. And we argue this is true both for the actor and for the recipient, and we did a series of studies to show this. Um, so this is work again by Ned and Weinstein and I, and in the first of the series of studies, we just did a basically a daily diary study recording days in which people helped other people. And on days when people helped other people, they had weekly greater well-being. 
But if they helped other people autonomously on those days, there was a much stronger correlation with increased well-being. In fact, on days when people autonomously helped another person, they had higher subjective well-being, more vitality, and more self-esteem than either people who didn't help or people who helped in a controlled way. In a second study, we did an experimental uh, task for people called the dictator task, in which a subject gets to a lot uh, money that's won during the experiment to the various participants. So in an autonomy group, people were free to give what they chose uh, to other people. But in the controlling condition, they were told what they had to disperse. Interestingly, when people could autonomously give money, the more they gave, the happier they were, the more wellness they, they showed. And on the other hand, when they were controlled, the more they gave, the worse they felt. Again, this shows that when the giving is autonomous, it can really enhance well-being. In still yet another study in this same series, we did an experiment uh, having people cooperate on a, a cognitive task. Actually, in one condition, they worked separately on the task so that they weren't cooperating at all. And in a second condition, one of the people was named eligible to win a prize, and the other participant was said, well, you can help that person if you want to. But, of course, they were free to... Um, help as they chose to. In this condition, those who were assigned to be helpers rated how much autonomy they felt for helping the person who could win the prize. Results showed that people who autonomously helped um, had higher well-being. They had more positive affect, they had more vitality and more self-esteem than people who either didn't help uh, in the no-help condition or who felt controlled in helping. Interestingly, recipients who received help from autonomous helpers also had a uh, rise in their well-being. They had more positive affect, more vitality, and more self-esteem. It seems that being helped by someone who's willingly doing it actually makes you feel better as the recipient of help. And there's a fourth study in this series using a different task and a different helping situation that replicated these results, both for recipient and the helper uh, themselves. Um, and again, showing that as long as the help is not coming from control motives, it's likely to do good for both helper and recipient. Now, it's important to note that in these studies, the positive effects on well-being that came from helping behavior were mediated by enhanced feelings of autonomy, competence, and relatedness in both helpers and the recipients of help. Following up on these results, Netta Weinstein, uh, Cody DeHaan, and I did uh, a few new studies that focused on recipients of help. In particular, we had recipients uh, read various helping scenarios in which different motives for helping were implied. And, uh, and so they read scenarios sometimes where the person who was the helper was doing it out of a personal value or a strong interest. Um, in other scenarios, people help more out of feelings like they should help or to avoid guilt. And the rating suggested that people felt a lot more gratitude when helpers were autonomous than when helpers were operating by control motives. In fact, when helping interactions were characterized by more autonomous helpers, uh, they were predictive of more positive feelings, more positive attitudes toward the helper, and greater felt closeness. And importantly, gratitude, the feelings of gratitude, mediated these effects of autonomy and control on recipients' well-being. In other words, when your helper was autonomous, you felt more gratitude, and this was related to your feeling better yourself. Um, after these experiments, uh, we continue to take interest in uh, helping and in altruism, and a particularly interesting set of studies has been initiated by Frank Martella, uh, a Finnish scholar who studied both with us in Rochester and has continued uh, his work in this area uh, subsequently. When Frank first came to Rochester, he was uh, interested in whether these positive effects of helping on well-being uh, required that you saw the impact of your help. For instance, did you need to see the person get helped or did you need some uh, expectation of reciprocity? So to rule out that altruism required a reciprocation or of some kind of vicarious experience, he developed an experimental paradigm in which people played a computer game and when they scored well in the computer game, rice was donated to needy people through a world uh, food program. In a second condition, they played the same video game, but when they scored, they just scored. You got the enjoyment of scoring, but there was no mention of rice being donated to another. 
What he found is that when people played the game with the rice donation condition attached to it, they had more positive affect than just when playing the game alone. And they found more meaning in the uh, activity. They also, subsequent to playing the game, had more energy as was displayed by their performance on a Stroop task, which is a uh, cognitive task that we usually use to look at depletion effects. As one would expect as well, when people played the rice game, they had greater feelings of beneficence they felt more benevolent. And all three basic psychological needs were increased. They felt more autonomy, more competence and relatedness while playing this benevolence game. So these increases in psychological need satisfaction of autonomy, competence, and relationship mediated between condition and the raise and well-being outcomes as SDT predicts. So the sense of beneficence, which we measured in this experimental study seemed predictive of wellness and other positive measures. And we decided, well, we'll start looking at just what kind of role that feeling of beneficence of contributing others might play in day-to-day well-being. Um, in another study that we published in the Journal of Personality, um, I cite here a daily diary study in which we show that positive affect and vitality on a given day are associated as we'd always expect in SDT with greater sense of autonomy, with greater sense of competence and greater sense of relatedness to others. But benevolence experienced in a day also contributes to well-being above and beyond these other basic needs showing just how important it is as a potential enhancer of wellness. In fact, uh, in the journal personality study, we do a little bit of meta-analysis across studies and show that autonomy, competence, and relatedness are robust predictors of well-being, but beneficence hangs in there to add something extra for us. We found the same thing, by the way, in looking at the issue of meaning in life, meaning on a daily basis and meaning in general. And this is a study that uh, uh, I got to do with Frank Martella and Michael Steiger, who I mentioned before, uh, who studies meaning. Here we found that people experienced more meaning on days when they had autonomy, more day, on days when they felt more competence, on days when they felt more relatedness, and strongly on days when they did something that helped them feel like they were contributing or benevolent. Similarly, um, Frank and uh, Tapani Reiki had done a study in the workplace showing very similar results, which is that meaningful work, a sense of meaning in your uh, employment is driven by satisfactions of autonomy, competence, relatedness, and beneficence. So when it comes to well-being, eudaimonic goals and benevolent acts seem to contribute quite a bit. But how about the other side of our hypothesis? Does social harm lead to ill-being? You know, we get a hint from that from the famous Milgram experiments. You know, Milgram uh, did a bunch of experiments in the 1950s in which he had authorities tell people to shock seemingly innocent participants. And most people obeyed. They seemed to comply with authorities, uh, even when it appeared that they were doing harm to others. But the untold story in the Milgram experiments are often untold stories that even these people who complied suffered a lot. Many of them felt a lot of anxiety. Some of them suffered symptoms of nausea and sweating, and they left in a disturbed and distressed state. And some subsequent studies have even suggested that participants in such a study could suffer from PTSD as a result of having inflicted harm on others. Now, that was never shown empirically, it's been more descriptive, but uh, Nikki Legate and uh, her colleagues decided to take a, another look at that using a kind of modern experimental method of a more uh, ethical design and a basic needs model to, to show this negative effect of harming others. So what they did is they had an experimental paradigm called a cyberball game in which you, on a computer, throw a ball to other participants in the game. And the cyberball paradigm has been used to study ostracism. So you'll have uh, three people throwing a ball to each other in a computer game, and then two of them will start throwing to each other and exclude the third person generating feelings of ostr being ostracized, which has a very negative effect on people's well-being. Nikki wanted to test the opposite result, which is if you're put in the position to ostracize, if you're told don't throw the ball to a certain person and exclude them, will this cause harm to you? And that's what she showed in an experiment. She showed that uh, uh, she had three conditions in the experiment, one where people were uh, in a neutral condition, they were allowed to throw the ball as uh, freely as they wanted to the other participants. In a second condition, 
they were told to throw the ball equally. So this was called the complier condition uh, where you wanted to have the experimenter tell people what to do. It said, throw the ball equally to everybody. And then an ostracizer condition in which the experimenter said to the participant, don't throw the ball, for instance, to subject B and exclude them. So here's a place where you're being put in a position to do psychological harm. And indeed, people who were uh, in the condition of being an ostracizer had more negative affect. And impact of condition on negative affect was mediated by basic psychological needs. And in particular, the loss of feelings of autonomy and relatedness in those people who were ostracizers. In a second experiment, uh, uh, Legate and colleagues compared ostracizers with people who were ostracized and with a neutral condition. And they found that both ostracizers and ostracized had greater distress than people in the neutral condition as we'd expect, but the nature of the distress was different. People who were ostracizers felt shame and guilt, whereas the people who were ostracized felt more anger. And these results were also mediated by basic psychological needs with people who were ostracized feeling lower relatedness, but people who were ostracizers feeling lower autonomy. In still a subsequent experiment, we not only replicated these results, but we gave people a chance to right the wrong and by providing them a condition to play again with the people they had ostracized. And uh, interestingly, Legate and all, and, et al. in 2015 found that people who had ostracized and felt, of course, distressed from ostracizing, uh, now in a uh, subsequent opportunity threw the ball more to the person they had previously excluded, seemingly trying to rectify the wrong. And again, it shows us how it's not easy to do harm to others, and we'd like to do otherwise. Finally, Legate, Weinstein, and Ryan uh, have just recently published a study trying to look at ostracism in real life uh, settings. In one, we just used a recall setting, trying to have people recall times in which they had ostracized others, sometimes ostracize others because of social pressure, sometimes ostracize others because they felt it was justified, and sometimes they not ostracizing others. And the results show that even in remembering these instances of justified ostracism of others, there was still greater distress than in not ostracizing. So even justifying it doesn't take away the distress that one feels. And further in a daily diary study, uh, Legate et al. showed that ostracizing others or being ostracized are both problematic. They both lead to lower need satisfaction and they both contribute to lower health, but through these different pathways. So this evidence showing how doing harm leads to ill-being and doing good leads to well-being fits really nicely with an SDT's more general model. Our general model suggests that when we have social contexts, for instance, families and societies that are supporting people's basic psychological needs, people will act with more benevolence and with more pro-social orientations. And this in turn will lead to greater need satisfaction and thus higher well-being and happiness. But obviously, when we find ourselves in circumstances that are threatening, need thwarting, either in our families and our societies, we develop in more antisocial and selfish ways. And this leads to greater basic need frustration and lower well-being overall. Now, how much evidence is there for that? And within STT, well, we have to say plenty. In fact, for instance, there's been a lot of work looking at family environments and how they impact people's pro-social development. Just as a couple of examples of consider work by Miklikowska and her colleagues who've shown that parental autonomy support during teenage years is associated with increased development of empathy. Work by Bureau and Margot uh, in Canada also showed that autonomy supportive parenting leads to more honest teenagers, teenagers who are who see more costs in not being honest with parents and who are more likely to have open dialogues with them. Data shows that more need supportive parents have children who develop greater capacities for self-regulation, who are more prone to internalization and who develop more positive relationships with others. And our own studies uh, in the intrinsic and extrinsic goal literature show that more autonomy supportive and need supportive parenting is associated with children developing stronger intrinsic goal orientations, whereas controlling parenting is associated with uh, more extrinsic orientations and less of a eudaimonic lifestyle. Looking on the other side from autonomy support, Georges May and her colleagues in Canada have shown uh, with really convincing longitudinal data that more controlling parenting 
leads to greater trajectories of physical aggression over the elementary school years. In fact, controlling maternal controlling parenting predicted increased trajectories of aggression over and above uh, other characteristics that we usually consider predictors of aggression, like being male, having a reactive temperament, having parents who are separated or having a young mother, even controlling for these things, controlling parenthood shows uh, a relationship with increasing aggression over time. These and many, many related studies just back up the idea that need supportive environments lead people to be more pro-socially prone. And this suggests we should be able to intervene in order to enhance pro-social behavior by creating more autonomy supportive environments. You know, Chion, Reeve, and Numanis uh, in 2018 published a study where they had done an intervention with PE, uh, with physical education teachers to enhance their autonomy support in the classroom. And they found that it not only, uh, the intervention not only increased PE teachers' autonomy support, but that resulted in students uh, exhibiting greater pro-social behavior and diminished antisocial behavior in the classroom atmosphere. A really important intervention study was done by Avi Asor, Guy Roth, Haya Kaplan, and their other colleagues at, uh, at Ben Gurion University in uh, Israel. They did an intervention called the I-Thou intervention that was based on SDT's uh, vision of autonomy support. And the intervention was uh, oriented to help teachers become more autonomy supportive in the classroom environments. What they found is that the I Thou intervention did increase the uh, students' perception that teachers were all my, uh, more autonomy supportive because teachers' behaviors changed. And that led to decreased bullying because uh, children internalized the value of being respectful to one another. In other words, by creating a more humane, autonomy supportive atmosphere, bullying was decreased in part through increasing students' internalization. Now, it's true that the environment can affect our pro-social attitudes and uh, a more need supportive environment will help that out, but can we cultivate pro-sociality within ourselves? And I think in, in the context of positive psychology, many of us are for, for, yeah, familiar with the one route through which we might do so, and that's the route of mindfulness. Mindfulness, as you all probably know, means the open and receptive awareness of what's occurring in the moment. When we're mindful, we're not defensive, and we're letting our, our uh, perceptions unfold of what's occurring. And when we are mindful, we're likely, we think, to be more pro-social. In fact, recently a meta-analysis that was led by James Donald of the University of Sydney uh, verified just that, that the more mindful people are, the more they engage in pro-social behavior. And this is shown both in correlational studies as well as intervention studies. So mindfulness is indeed connected with pro-social behavior and with positive well-being, as, as much research shows. But the question is why or through what process does that occur? And we've recently introduced a process model based on self-determination theory of how mindfulness conduces to pro-social act by increasing our capacities for autonomy. So just again, mindfulness being open and receptive awareness, we think it's the ground of autonomous functioning because when you become more aware of your needs, when you become more aware of whatever conflicts might be in a situation, when you let your values uh, penetrate into awareness, in other words, when you're in a position to take all things considered, you're gonna probably make them the best decisions and those that are most reflective of your own values. Now, there's plenty of evidence out there. And this came even from our earliest studies of mindfulness that I did with uh, Kirk Brown when we were first validating measures of mindfulness. We found on a day-to-day -day basis that in moments when people were more mindful, they were also uh, exhibiting more autonomous motivation. And this was also true at the trait level. People who have higher trait level mindfulness also have higher trait level autonomy. This connection between mindfulness and autonomy I, indeed has now become well-established and um, a meta-analysis that we did and was presented in PSPB in 2019, I, I think nails this conclusion shut. Uh, again, James Donald of this meta-analysis and in it, he showed that mindfulness was associated systematically with a different kind of motivations in SDT's taxonomy with more controlled motivations, such as a motivation being externally regulated or being interjected, being negatively associated with mindfulness and intrinsic motivation and identified motivation, these more autonomous forms of motivation being positively associated with mindfulness. 
Put differently, when we're highly mindful, we're likely to be behaving in a way that we can self-endorse. And when we do so, we're likely to be acting pro-socially. So here's one last meta-analysis that I'll mention here, which is, again, led by James Donald. And uh, he and his colleagues summarized over 140 studies that involved over 75,000 participants. And across all that data, they find that when people are more autonomously motivated, they act in more pro-social ways. And oppositely, when people are more control-oriented or control-motivated, they act in more anti-social ways. It thus seems that when we have awareness, we have more autonomy. And when we have more autonomy, we often, indeed as a default, act in more benevolent and pro-social ways. Thus, by cultivating awareness and more generally being non-defensive and open in our experiences, SDT, SDT suggests that we'll be more integrated in our behavior. And that will typically reflect, uh, be reflected in increased pro-social and lower antisocial behaviors. You know, one conclusion you would get from reading the SDT literature is that among the most autonomous things we do is to care for others. You know, when we love others, we do so wholeheartedly and we do so volitionally. And uh, so it's very central to autonomy that it's not in any way antithetical to relatedness. And of course, this is fully in accord with Aristotle's argument that eudaimonia is especially furthered more by loving rather than in looking to be loved. So in summary, basic psychological needs satisfactions represent the foundations of wellness and flourishing according to self-determination theory. And when we pursue intrinsic life goals, such as contributing to our community, personally growing and establishing deep intimate relationships, this enhances our wellness via enhancing our autonomy, competence and relatedness. Autonomous pro-social actions also really satisfy basic needs, yielding greater well-being while doing harm is costly to wellness and thwarts basic psychological need satisfactions. Meta-analyses and intervention studies are increasingly linking autonomy and pro-social actions and control and anti-social actions, um, suggesting that autonomy and basic need supportive environments are the ways and the pathways through which we can uh, foster more pro-social behavior as well as greater individual flourishing. And in terms of self-cultivating our benevolence, mindfulness helps us get there by being aware and open to what's going on. We get more in touch with our own values and act in a more humane manner. I hope this uh, brief talk about pro-social and anti-social behavior has given you some idea of the activities that are going on within self-determination theory in this area. Uh, and draw you to look more deeply into the theory, which is you know, really a community effort by uh, hundreds of psychologists and, uh, and researchers across the world. This is a really uh, difficult year for many of us. There's been a lot of need thwarting this year. People haven't experienced the relatedness or the autonomy that they would like. And so it's a great time to be thinking about benevolence and helping each other through these difficult times. Um, before I stop, I'd also like to just give a brief thanks to the Center for Self-Determination Theory for supporting me and uh, giving this talk. And I'd like to thank all of you for being patient and listening to a talk that's uh, not live, but done in an empty room in front of a camera to no audience at all. I hope it's been engaging in some ways, and I look forward to the question and answer period about to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>